In reality, this outfit would be led by Captain Ralph E. Gorenson. Now, the modern U.S. Army Rangers were actually established in Great Britain and modeled after British commandos. Hi, if you're new here, I'm Kylie, just another Army vet. And considering that today is the 79th anniversary of D-Day, I thought I'd go ahead and react to a video called How Accurate a Saving Private Ryan, a World War II D-Day Special. And this is by the channel World War II with Indy Nidell. Now, this should be a good one. Indy always has great content. Let's get to it. Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan is known as one of the most accurate war movies when it comes to attention to detail. And the amount of work that was put into the uniforms and weaponry, the scenery and the atmosphere is astonishing. Yet there are some things that had to be sacrificed for the sake of cinematography or the enjoyment of the audience. And a few things the movie simply gets wrong. So let's take a closer look at the events and characters of the opening battle scenes of Saving Private Ryan. I'm Indy Nidell, and this is a World War II double secret probation special. And why are we doing this special? Because... <laughs> if you got the pop culture reference to what he just said, then drop that in the comments. Next year in June, we'll premiere our massive D-Day marathon of coverage. But now in September, in Normandy, we'll be shooting the on-location stuff for that. And we've raised enough money on Patreon for that stage of the project. So this today is a thank you to all of you who have supported the project so far, and just a fun reminder in general that we're doing it. Okay, here we go. The Omaha beach scenes begin on a row of Czech hedgehogs. These are some of the typical World War II defenses deployed as anti-tank or generally anti-vehicle barriers. They are known as Czech because they were at first part of the Czech border defenses against the German invasion pre-1938 and the Munich Agreement. Then we see landing craft splashing through rough water. Now, these are accurate LCVPs, a derivative of the original Higgins boat. However, these American-made landing craft are largely absent from the landings at D-Day, as most were shipped to the Pacific Theater, as I've talked about in the regular episodes. At Omaha Beach, well, at Normandy in general, we would see some of them, but the Rangers would have been in British LCA landing craft assault, which are also steered by British personnel and not Americans. Some of the men are vomiting or shaking, which could stem from nerves over what is to come, but can also, of course, be the rough seas. Although they did many rehearsals, these men are soldiers and not specially maritime trained Marines. Also, these boats would have been in the water for some time, loading, circling around, getting into formation, sometimes hours before hitting the beaches. And this is what the military calls hurry up and wait. I'm not sure what time the boats actually embarked toward the beaches. Let's just say five o'clock in the morning, which means that those soldiers were probably staged and ready to go by about 02 or 03 o'clock. So even before they hit the beaches, they already had a long day. And these landing craft are not seagoing boats and are pushed around by the waves quite easily, especially in the strong currents in front of the beaches. We see Tom Hanks, a.k.a. Captain John Miller. His character is to lead Company C of the 2nd Ranger Battalion into battle. In reality, this outfit would be led by Captain Ralph E. Gorenson. Now, the modern U.S. Army Rangers were actually established in Great Britain and modeled after British commandos. So when he says commandos, does he mean the Special Boat Service or the SAS? Intended as an elite formation, they often got special assignments. 
At Normandy, this is generally the destruction of German gun batteries. Like so I'm not sure if any Rangers actually landed at Omaha or Utah beaches. However, I do know that they were given the special mission of actually scaling up the cliffs at Point de Hoc, which is about four or five miles west of Omaha. And the only reason why I know that is because I actually took a trip to Normandy to see all the beaches, as well as I got to see Point de Hoc. Scaling those cliffs was no easy task. Like they do at Pointe du Hoc, roughly four miles west of Omaha Beach. Most of Omaha Beach is assaulted by regular infantry. Omaha Beach itself is divided into a bunch of sections. Charlie, Dog Green, Dog White, Dog Red, Easy, Fox, like that. In the movie, and at first, in reality as well, the Rangers of Company C are heading towards the Dog Green sector. The 2nd Ranger Battalion is teamed up with the 116th Infantry Regiment of the 29th Infantry Division and split into task forces. While Task Force A is busy scaling the cliffs at Pointe du Oak, it is Task Force B that is scheduled to land near the 116th at Omaha. The initial plan at Dog Green is to achieve several breakthroughs and capture the German strongpoint of Vierville right behind the beach defenses, but plans are subject to dramatic change, and I'll get back to that later on. So now Tom Hanks, Captain Miller, gives his men some last minute orders and advice, which is probably mostly for the audience, as the men would have rehearsed what to do after hitting the beach like, like a thousand times. So Indy is right, they practiced those landings for weeks or months prior to the invasion. However, it wasn't uncommon for a commander to do a last minute speech like that. Tightly packed men in a boat are a major target, and the only way to change that is to get off the boat quickly and spread out on the beach. There is no backwards, no retreat, not much room for tactical movements to the sides. The only real choice is to get to the end of the beach as quickly as possible and develop a tactical situation from there. The worst thing that can happen is to be stuck on the wide open beach. Now, this might be the most glaring inaccuracy of the whole landing scene. The scale of the beach is way, way too shallow. The beach at Omaha is much larger, much deeper, so the distance from the German positions to the landing crab is way further. So Steven Spielberg specifically chose this beach in Ireland because it had a shallow perspective or scope, and that was because he knew it would look better on screen. The German machine gunners would have seen the men in the landing craft as much smaller figures. No German machine gunner was sitting in a bunker like this, basically firing at point-blank range at boats under his nose. That does seem really close, though. From what I remember at Omaha Beach, the pillboxes or the bunkers that I saw were way back. So yeah, that is way too close. There is a difference of opinion about the effects of the preliminary bombardment by the Allied Air Force and Navy. Many sources say it smashed German defenses on a wide scale. Nearly all large caliber artillery and anti-tank gun emplacements were wrecked, as were many communication stations, ammunition stores, and even the Goliath control stations that were in place. Stephen Ambrose, though, and some others, do not share this view. Stephen Ambrose? was the historian who actually wrote the book Band of Brothers from which the movie or miniseries was based on. But anyhow, here the main defensive tools of the Germans center on machine guns, the MG-42. Ah, the MG-42. I'm pretty sure that's the same weapon that I fired when I was actually trying to compete for my German Army Martianship badge. It is a tried and tested weapon that has been in use up until the last couple of years by the Bundeswehr. And stuff like mines, barbed wire, and field mortars. 
The belt-fed MG42 is extremely deadly. At Omaha, although the Germans have quite a few of them, possibly as many as 85, ammunition and replacement barrels are in short supply. See, the MG42 needs its barrels replaced often because of overheating, and both ammo and spare barrels run out quickly. A nice detail here is that the tracer bullets are kept in a white, yellowish color, not green lightsabers like in that other war movie. What other war movie is he referring to? If you know, please drop it in the comments. The thing also accurate is the smoke and dust and fog that surrounds the beach. It really was not possible to watch the attack unfold from the sea. Here we see a soldier having his M1 packed into what looks like a plastic bag, which is actually a rubber-based substance called pliofilm, intended to keep the weapons clear of sand and salt water. Nice little detail. Spielberg is the master of details. Another little inaccuracy though, is the amount of obstacles on the beach. The Germans love boasting about their, their mighty Atlantic wall, which makes you think of row after row of heavy bunkers and defenses. But in reality, most of the stuff is makeshift and last minute. For at this point in the war, they have neither the material nor the manpower to build all that. But for cinemagraphic reasons, you wanna pack as much stuff into frame as possible. And speaking of obstacles, Next to those anti-vehicle hedgehogs, you see the Hembalken, which are also called Rommel asparagus. Named after Elvin Rommel, who oversees the defenses here in 1944, although he is ironically absent on D-Day itself. Wasn't Rommel's nickname the Grey Fox, or am I thinking of someone else? Okay, Rommel asparagus is really logs set standing up in fields to foil paratroops. But yeah. these are set in holes in the beach blasted with a hose to foil attacks from the sea and are often also called that. In the movie, they are actually facing the wrong way though. The way they're supposed to work is that the boats slide up the tripod at high tide and hit a teller mine placed at the end. The D-Day attacks begin at low tide though. So the allies can see the beach obstacles, but on the downside have more beach to cross. Anywhere but here. Yes, I've seen this movie too many times. Company C lands at approximately 6.45 a.m. and the landing craft come immediately under heavy machine gun and mortar fire. In fact, most of the casualties happen in the first half hour, when the men are the least protected and the most huddled together. And actually, the lead LCA was hit before even reaching the shore and 15 men were killed in real life. But also, wounded men drown, like we see here, and you can't really stop to help others as there would then be two men hit instead of one. So Tactical Combat Casualty Care, or TC3, the first phase of that is called Care Under Fire, and that's when you have fire superiority, and then you put a tourniquet on someone and drag them to safety. At this point in the movie though, they have not even reached the first phase of tactical field care. So no, it would be a very unwise decision, tactically, to actually try to help someone at this point. Throughout the beach scene, we see the soldiers huddling together for protection under obstacles or behind obstacles. Suppressing fire is really something that weakens the will to move. So it really is important for captains and sergeants to drive their men forward. At 6.49 in the scene, Miller says that every inch of the beach would be pre-sighted, which in itself is an accurate assumption, as it is standard procedure for German artillerymen. But those range tables were kind of useless, as most howitzers and guns were wrecked at this point. But still, getting off the beach is the only available option. Order, sir. You go somewhere else. I'm clearing this one. Come on, Briggs. At 
758 in the seam. Engineers are part of the attack to destroy the obstacles so tanks can come through. Amphibious operations with infantry alone are difficult enough, but landing tanks is a technical nightmare. Even without the obstacles, the beach offers very little traction. At other parts of Normandy, they land bulldozers to deal with the obstacles. Miller argues that the tanks are already floundering in the channel, which is only kind of true. Almost all of the armor of the accompanying 741st Tank Battalion indeed fails to land at Omaha and sinks, but that is far off in the east. But Miller could not have known that yet. Here at Dog Green, around 16 M4A1 duplex drive Shermans would have made it to the beach at this time. That's another example of Steven Spielberg just putting that in for dramatic purposes. Now back to the scale of the beach. As I said, it's way too shallow, just, just a narrow strip of land. In the movie, it takes them like 10 minutes to get up the beach. In reality, it was a several hour long operation. The Americans were indeed bogged down at Dog Green, to the point where High Command even thought of some sort of evacuation plan. Okay, Marcus's and my personal pet peeve with the whole beach scene really comes here. That giant German bunker, from which the machine gunners are firing right into the oncoming landing craft. Of course, if you think of German bunkers, that's what you picture. But in fact, that's just what Nazi propaganda wants you to think. Giant Legelbau casemates of reinforced concrete. But again, reality is much different. This here in the movie is a German observation bunker, but but on steroids. It resembles a Schnabelstand, recognizable by the huge slit. A typical German machine gun or artillery bunker would not have such a massive slit. These ones are intended for housing rangefinders. In reality, the Germans have basically two main but much smaller bunkers in place at Dog Green. Codenamed WN72 for Widerstandsnest or Resistance Nest 72. One houses a 50mm pedestal anti-tank gun, the other an 88mm Pac-43. There is also a concrete seawall, some smaller concrete machine gun pillboxes, mortar pits, and trenches. The approaches to WN72 and the beach exit are guarded by mines and barbed wire. It is these defenses that are the main reason why Dog Green is so deadly. First, the preliminary bombing run left much of these defenses untouched. Second, the two German bunkers and the seawall close off the beach exit. Clear the shingles. Barbed wire, as always in modern battles, is one of the most frustrating obstacles to overcome. Bangalore torpedoes are pole charges and are used to clear mines and barbed wire. The bangers are used quite a lot throughout D-Day, actually. And once the Americans manage to break the line, there is indeed not much left to face them. The bunkers are breached with grenades and flamethrowers, and there are several small-scale fights along the trenches, but nothing in terms of a defense in depth or some mobile armor reserve. So after being stationed in Germany for six years, I definitely can recognize the German language or Deutsch. And I don't know what language they were speaking, but it definitely was not German. Now on to the famous scene where the Americans shoot the two surrendering soldiers. These soldiers speak Czech, saying they are not Germans and did not mm. kill anyone. This is another nice detail. Oh, well, okay, not nice, but it accurately portrays that the defenders at Omaha and Normandy are not 
elite veteran Wehrmacht soldiers, but, but quite the opposite. Many of the men manning the defenses are auxiliaries, often Volksdeutsche, ethnic Germans, drafted into the Wehrmacht from occupied countries like Czechoslovakia. Many of the guns are also secondhand Czech or French ones. This is the Wehrmacht of 1944. Troops consigned to festungs or fortress duty are far from being of high fighting value. Look how young those kids are. Oh. Most of them are very young or very old and often frightened out of their minds. The few battled hardened soldiers and officers there are are mainly too wounded for other jobs. There's a whole sector held by men that are recovering from stomach wounds. But why is Saving Private Ryan sometimes called alternate history when it comes to the involvement of the Rangers in the movie version of Dog Green? Well, here's the shocking twist. Unlike in the movie, the Rangers are not in the first wave to hit the beach. It is actually part of the 29th Division that lands right before them. Upon realizing that the 29th is bogged down with heavy casualties, Company C of the Rangers cancels the direct assault at Dog Green. Instead, they try Plan B, an attack further to the west against Point Eras de la Percée. Here, the defenses are much lighter and, and are mostly bombed out. Still, by the time they reach the cliffs there, only 35 of the original 70 men are alive and able to climb them. Advancing upwards, they reach the top around 7.15 a.m. There, they are involved for the rest of the morning in clearing out a German fortified house and some trenches before joining up with the Ranger Task Force from Pointe du Hoc. So if I'm remembering correctly, the initial assault on Pointe du Hoc consisted of about 200, 250 Rangers. So in actual reality, trying to storm WN-72's defenses head on was doomed to fail and the attack was aborted. The concrete defenses there are eventually overcome around midday by engineers. So there you have it, a lot of accuracy and attention to the small details, even as the attack itself that is depicted is not what the actual Rangers attack was. We, as always, will strive for maximum accuracy in our mammoth D-Day coverage of the operations, concept, and execution. And all of the background, the players, the intelligence, the weapons, the people, the locations, the everything. It will be covered on an unprecedented scale and will be released on June 6, 2023. Today. It's the Time Ghost Army that is funding this whole D-Day project. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm really excited for this D-Day special. I'll definitely check out some of those videos and react to them and put them on the screen for you guys. I thought this was a good video and I think Indy Nidell made a lot of great points. However, for the average viewer, I think most of these inaccuracies are going to be very irrelevant. Steven Spielberg did have a good team of historians that were actually helping him with the film. And in my opinion, I think they did an excellent job. What do you guys think? But anyway, one detail that I'm surprised he left out, soldiers actually getting shot underwater, which is impossible possible unless you're maybe a foot or two from the surface. This water is about 800 times more dense than air, so once a bullet actually hits the water, it slows down dramatically and actually gets a little deformed and then it'll actually sink to the bottom. So I guess Spielberg did that for dramatic purposes. But anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. If you do want to watch another World War II video, I have one for you right here. If you do want to help support the channel, thank you so much. I could always use a comment, like, sub, share, or thanks.